next we have Brian Warner talking about the business of better tech. Um, he works as a lead on the Tahoe Laughs Project, a former Mozillian, the creator of BuildBot, and the co-founder of Tahoe Laughs. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Um, I have uh, two, two main goals for this talk. One of them is to sort of explore the idea of um, what we might call personal sovereign data storage. So you know, what kind of enabling technologies could we use to help try and uh, allow people to, be, to have control over their own data and what applications would look like uh, if they're enabling that kind of mode and talk a little bit about the business models around those. Um, and the second one, this is kind of a last minute talk, so my second goal is to win the coveted least organized, least professional looking talk of the day award. I understand there's a cash prize for this. Oh, no. Um, so I, this is for my new business model. It's called M-O-P-P-L-B-A-A-S. It's making other people's presentations look better as a service. <laughs> anyway, uh, so talk about uh, what, what do I mean by sovereign storage. Um, I'll explain this in terms of a project that I worked on. So about 10, 12 years ago, Zuko and I, a couple of other people at a company called All My Data, built this thing called Tahoe LAFS. And it's an encrypted distributed storage system. Um, that company, that startup, was doing personal backup services. So, you know, five, ten dollars a month, aimed at consumers at home, back up all of your pictures, your documents, uh, to a cloud service. We were really nervous about the privacy implications of that. We really felt that holding user data is a liability, but we're trying to, at the same time, try to provide this service uh, to people. So we, as the company, as the provider, did not want to see any of your data. We were really worried about what happens if our servers get hacked. We're worried about what happens if our servers are unreliable. This was early enough that it didn't make sense. The S3 was not the obvious answer back at this period of time. So we were talking about running our own servers for this process, um, and we, we didn't want to have really expensive, reliable servers. We wanted to have more commodity machines. So we built a system in which all of your files are encrypted on your local client machine, and then they get uh, erasure coded. They get redundantly spread across multiple servers before they get uploaded, so that uh, your data is safe even if some of those servers fail, and it is private even if all of the servers are maliciously trying to look at your data. So we had full confidentiality and integrity checking on that data. In the system that we built, every file had a separate little cryptographic handle. So there was this thing we called a file cap. It's a string that has the encryption key and some integrity data in it. And to get your file back, you need that handle. There's no other way of getting that file back. So, um, as, a, as a consequence, as a side effect of the way we built this, every file was individually addressable, individually shareable. Every directory uh, was, it had a separate little, little access string for it. So as a user, if you wanted to share a file with somebody else, or if you wanted to share a whole directory of files with somebody else, there was one string you had to hand to them. And you didn't need to negotiate with a back-end service. You didn't need to get permission. There was no uh, access control list that you had to get an entry into. There were no admins to the sharing mechanism. That was entirely controlled by the end users. And as we were building the system out, um, we found that that was a really powerful model for allowing applications to have access to just a little piece of data. If you could have an application and you give it one of these directory caps and say, here is your working storage, uh, here's, here is the space where you can write files to, you're not giving that application any more authority than to write to that one directory. It was really limited in that way. And as, as this project uh, grew, we, we open sourced the code before the company failed, so we're still able to work on it now. Least Authority is putting a lot of energy into Tahoe development uh, even today. We were exploring ways that uh, you could use this as a more general model for accessing files and, and giving, a, giving power to applications. So the idea would be that um, you, you have your storage, you bring your storage to the application. You have the, the storage space somewhere else. You have the encryption keys that let you access that. And you add that to an application rather than an application owning all of that stuff. Um, so, so the general idea of, of sovereign storage there is that uh, you get control over where all of your data is going because you are effectively providing that storage space and the access over that to these different applications. Um, and the, uh, the big thing about that is that you get control over it and you can move it from one place to another if you want to. If, the, if there's some provider, you might have that data on your local hard drive at home, but for reliability purposes and for sharing with other people easily, it's more likely you're gonna keep that data on some cloud provider. But if you get to choose where your data is stored, then you can also move it from one provider to another if that provider is not giving you the kind of service you want. 
So you know, you, you want to enable an ecosystem and a marketplace there where people have to compete on the quality of their, their service offering. So the, the next phase of this talk is kind of about applications. Um, it, it's fair to ask the question of why do we see these large applications, and, and here I'm meaning things like Instagram and Facebook and, and user-facing applications. Um, why does this modern crop, why do they collect so much data about us? Why do they hold so much data? And why are they so kind of greedy about trying to, to own all of that? Um, it, it's easier, I, it, most of these folks didn't really intend to build a surveillance system. You know, I think there are very few people that are sort of cynical and, and, and fearful and greedy enough to set out in the day and say, I want to build something that collects personal data on everybody in the world that I can then abuse. You know, it's, nobody thinks of themselves as evil. It's just kind of the easy path to walk when you're faced with a bunch of technical constraints or, or business opportunities, I guess. Um, so in a lot of these systems, it is so much easier for the, the company that's building this application to iterate if they control both ends of the wire, right? They have some sort of front-end program that's running on your local computer. They have their back-end system. They have their big data storage about the stuff you're storing there. And if they control all of that, then they can make a change to it, and they don't have to coordinate with anybody else. Um, it's also easier for them to lock people in. They discover that there's a business interest. You know, if you're a, a, a photo sharing service, and if I've spent you know, weeks uploading my entire photo collection up to your servers, then boy, I'm not really gonna go anywhere else. I'm gonna have to repeat all of that work. So there's a great sort of user lock-in business case um, for doing that, but that's obviously not in the user's interests. Um, and then a lot of these systems, they really want to own the namespace. Uh, there were some good articles several years ago about any, any um, uh, services that have you register for an account with that service versus ones that let you register with some existing account. You know, you use an email address uh, to log in versus you make a new username on the account. There's a sense of owning that username. You know, it's, it's, it's more sticky if somebody is um, unable to, to move their identity within your system from, from one namespace to another. So there are a lot of reasons why, why these services end up kind of grabbing um, grabbing this user data. And then uh, the other big part of that is, is kind of the advertising angle and the trying to figure out how to monetize these things in the long run. So Charlie Strauss uh, had, did the keynote at CCC just about a week ago, and he made this point, um, uh, his, his presentation is also on his blog, that we made this terrible mistake in about 1995 when the web was just starting out, and we decided to, we allowed it to be monetized with advertising rather than the, the internet that had grown up before that was an academic and a, a government uh, kind of subsidy thing. There were National Science Foundation grants, a lot of stuff from DARPA. And as a result, you wind up in this mode where a company doesn't really know what they're going to make money on. And they figure that if they just record everything, because that's gotten really cheap and easy, eventually they'll discover something in this giant pile of data to make some money on. Um, and so it's frustrating, you know, I, I, think, I think companies are not properly treating this big pile of user data as a liability, as this, this toxic asset, um, toxic waste that they need to, to avoid con collecting. Um, and then when, when you're building one of these applications, there are a lot of different uh, components to it, and we've managed to amortize the costs of some of those components, but, but not quite all of them. So these days, if you were setting out to build yourself an Instagram or a Flickr or something, and, and you kind of start with this goal of w our mission statement is to help people share photos with their friends. And then kind of secondary goal is make a lot of money. And, and that's fine, you know, it, it, and it's great to have that stuff be sustainable. But, it, but the, the primary goal is to help people share pictures with their friends. Then they should have a model that allows them to do that and, and have more control over that. So on the front end, what you're really doing is building a program that's going to run on your operating system and has to interact with other components in your, in your operating system. There's this kind of negotiation of interests. Um, and this program that you're writing, at this point, there are a lot of components we can use on the front end of that. The web is now the kind of universal operating system for running these things. There are programming tools that we can pull off the shelf. You have the jQueries, you have the Reacts, you have all these different frameworks. Um, We've figured out how to cooperate with other developers on the front end part to reduce the cost of writing that considerably. There's the back end component that's kind of specific to your business model, and then there's this giant pile of storage that you have to go and pay Amazon to, to hold that data for. Um, we haven't quite figured out how to um, 
uh, how to amortize the development costs of that backend stuff. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see that done a bit better where rather than going to Flickr and saying, uh, I'm going to upload all my pictures to you and then you give me this sort of management editing interface, this application I use to look at pictures and choose them and choose which ones to share with other people. How about I keep my pictures on my own personal cloud bucket somewhere and I go to Instagram to give them the handle to that bucket and, and get your editing properties. And so you have this team of engineers making this great editor. I'm not paying you to store data. I already have somebody that does that and does that just fine. I just want to rent your editing tool for this purpose or editing your sharing tool. And so the idea there is that you, you want to support the development of the things that people have to be paid for, right? The, the engineering time to build that front end is important. But paying them for storage that I could get better elsewhere is wrong. Paying them to help connect me with all of my friends is also wrong. I should be able to bring my friends into this, um, this computer mediated conversation just as well as I bring my own storage into it. So the, the system that I, the, the goal I'd like to see here is something where we build applications in a way that let you uh, bring these assets and these, these, these objects to be edited. Uh, we bring those to the application rather than having each application own its own little silo of all those different things. Um, and the, the last piece of this, I, I have some optimistic hope for this in the future because I, as much as I hate the word blockchain, blockchain, every time I hear that word, I want to see it in all caps with an exclamation point at the end and kind of jazz hands at it. So when we talk about the word of blockchain, um, there, it, it's a new operating system in some senses. And, and each of the operating systems that we've seen so far have gone through a, a process of maturing. And if you think about early... PCs and the kind of shareware apps that you would get on them, or applications that are, are delivered on a CD-ROM. You know, some of you may be old enough to remember when you purchased software and it was a discrete thing and you like installed it and, and it didn't phone back home because there was no internet to phone back home to, or that it just didn't make sense. And, and there's a progression of increasing production values and increasing seriousness in any one of these operating systems. And each time you get a new one, you're allowed to go back to something that looks really crude and kind of hand-drawn for a couple of years until people start expecting better. Um, and you think about early days of the web and all of the really ugly, you know, blinking marquee tags and web rings and, and all that technology that looks really foolish now. That was a necessary step along this path to these very highly polished, very carefully tested. We, we've learned how to do the UX studies. We've learned how to internationalize things properly. We can do much better now than we used to. We have this new operating system that, that if, if, if Ethereum uh, missed these distributed applications, um, there are some things they, they probably do well. There are a lot of things that they don't do well. But it is a new space, and we're seeing applications that are very crude now, but will get a lot better. There seems to be a pattern in this distributed application space where they're really avoiding having servers involved. They want a system, you know, crypto kitties. They, they want a system in which you can... Um, interact with programs and you have some sort of user agent that's, that represents the program's interests, represents the user's interests, renders on your screen, lets you make decisions about what's going to happen, that is running independently on everybody's separate computers. Um, the combination of people's, uh, that trend in this space and the difficulty of storage, storing large amounts of data on these blockchain systems, um, I think are, are, are giving us some hope that we can kind of point this boat in a different direction than the web went um, so that we can wind up with applications that ask you for some storage to use or ask you for what data it's supposed to work on rather than assuming that the, the company providing that application drives everything. So that's, that's kind of the, the collection of it. Um, it's being able to have distributed systems in which there are fine-grained access control for each of these different objects um, feels like the, the right structure to help kind of drive this stuff. So that's what my hope is. Um, I'm kind of hoping that I can we can get more progress of that now that the, the distributed application space is becoming more interesting. Thanks. <laughs> time for one or two questions before the panel? I'd probably have time for one or two questions before the panel. If anybody has the thoughts or anything? Yeah. Um, thank you for that interesting talk. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering because literally almost all of the businesses online make money through advertising. I think it's super hard. Like, I think that's it's a 
the main problem is in finding maybe a different way to make money for them. So what are your thoughts on that for them? The, uh, my thoughts are that I think there should be plenty of room to make smaller amounts of money in these companies. And if you were to look at what the company needs to build that business, like you know, if the goal is to help people share pictures with each other, then there's a lot of, of front-end development work that needs to take place. Um, and the other thing that makes me hopeful about the blockchain world is that uh, it, it might be possible to pay smaller amounts of money to people. And that you know, was the hope of kind of Bitcoin originally, and we've seen that that particular one is not very good at, at spending small amounts of money anywhere. But if newer systems can fix that process, and if, I can, if my user agent can give you a penny for the service I've gotten from your, your system today, then uh, like the speaker said earlier, if you could pay Facebook 10, 15 euros a year for the service they're giving you, that would make up all of the revenue that they're getting from advertising and be far less caustic um, to, to, to our data sovereignty. So my hope is that in this new operating system, in this new paradigm, people might be content with making enough money to cover their development costs and have opportunities to make that money with something other than advertising uh, in a way that doesn't depend upon having so much data. Anyone else? Any other questions? One of the things you talked about was um, advertising, right, and consumer-based stuff. But what about like a sales force, like a B two B, where they own their own data, they own their own, you know, customer lists? But I mean, a lot of times, especially when you're talking about businesses, the you know they're not so worried because they can trust the Salesforce name, right? I mean, how, how does that compare to being able to trust, like, something that was talked about earlier with, like, the, the passing around, like, a, a, an encryption key, right? I mean, how, how do you kind of resolve that, I trust Salesforce versus I have this encryption key that I might lose and someone has to take care of it? My, my feeling is that if, as a business, you could go to Salesforce and give them the key for your data and say, you know, here, there's some good business reason why you should have access to this big pile of stuff. Um, because you're going to analyze it and give me useful results from it, then that's great. You know? and, and if you decide you don't like Salesforce anymore and you want to move to somebody else, then you should be able to revoke that access key and give a new one to a second to service provider. Um, there are situations in which the, the value you're getting out of the data depends upon looking at lots of different pieces of data at the same time. Um, you know, the, the Tahoe model is more one file at a time or one directory at a time access. Um, but I think there are ways to implement it that would give you more dire uh, database query sorts of access. And then you would give company A the ability to do a certain kind of query or a certain set of queries, but not some others. Um, uh, revocation, yeah. That, that is in the scope of Tahoe. We haven't made a lot of progress on that, but it's definitely something that's been on our roadmap. Okay. All right, thanks very much. Thank you.